Well, our first keynote address will begin, and I invite Ek De Val from the National Autonomous University of Mexico to present Dr. James Chatters to us. Well, I would like to welcome you again to Merida. We are very pleased to have this meeting in Mexico and particularly in this beautiful area of the country. I am very pleased to have the honor to introduce our plenary speaker today for this ATVC meeting, Dr. Jim Chaters. Dr. Jim Chaters received his PhD in anthropology in 1982 from the University of Washington. He is currently semi-retired but serves as the lead scientist for the Hoyo Negro project. He is an archaeologist and paleontologist who has been involved in the discovery and investigation of many North America's earliest human skeletons. His research has addressed the archaeology of hunter-gatherers in the western U.S., Pleistocene vertebrate, paleontology, palynology of the latest Pleistocene and Holocene, paleohydrology and human bioarchaeology. So, as you can see, he has plenty of experience in this area. He is best known for, his, for the 1996 discovery of Kennewick Man. He is the author of many scholarly articles in journals and books, as well as a trade book, Ancient Encounters, Kennewick Man and the First Americans. He is currently owner of the Applied Paleoscience, a consulting services service and advisor of the Direct AMS, a commercial radiocarbon dating company, both in Bothell, Washington. Today, today, Dr. Chaters will talk about a nearby site in the limestone caves of the Yucatan Peninsula that are offering an almost unmatched skeletal record of large mammals dating to the time of humans' first arrival in the Americas. Most large mammal discoveries are being made underwater in the submerged caves of the Belize and Mexican state of Quintana Roo. The most spectacular and informative of these is the site of Hoyo Negro, located at the confluence of three 300 meter long tunnels. So with no further introduction, please welcome Dr. Chaters with a warm applause, please. Ah, here we go. Buen dia. Um, Dr. Mart Martinez Ramos, gracias para invitarme. Um, es un honor para presentar un magistral en este congreso. El trabajo que um, todos de ustedes, de, que, hacen, que hacen todos de ustedes, es muy importante para la salud de ecosistemas mundial. Um, thank you, Dr. Martinez Ramos, for inviting me here. It's a great honor to speak at this Congress. It's unusual for me to speak to people who aren't in my field, but I feel very safe because of that. Uh, you have no idea whether I'm saying it right or not. Um, but the work you're doing is really, really important. Um, to the security and uh, the health of ecosystems worldwide, and, and I very much appreciate what you're doing here. So I'm going to provide you with a little entertainment, but also give you a background about sort of why there is less biodiversity in the, in the uh, Yucatan region than there once was. Where do I hold this? No trabajo. No trabajo. Okay. As you are well aware, and I won't dwell on it very much, um, the ecosystems of Central, Amer Central America, and I include in that the Yucatan, are extremely diverse. And not only do you have incredibly diverse topography in this, in this small area, uh, ranging from high mountains to very flat, low, um, low elevation uh, plateaus or plains, like the Yucatan itself, uh, with a 
a very, very rich flora that ranges from cloud forests in the high mountains down to uh, deserts in various patches of, of uh, northern Guatemala, Belize, and, and uh, northernmost Yucatan. So you have almost every possible kind of arrangement you could have in the tropics right here. Within that system, then, you have a broad diversity of insects, reptiles, mammals, birds that uh, is almost unmatched. When we look at the mammalian part of that ecosystem, we see a high diversity of mesofauna. There are a lot of um, small mustelids, felids, uh, a few little canids, um, a lot of insectivores, a lot of omnivores. It's, it's a really, really diverse system uh, of smaller animals. But when we get into the megafauna, I've got to figure out this thing here. Where do I point this? <laughs> okay. We really don't have very much megafauna. And I'm including these little peccaries in there, too, because I'm just trying to give us something to talk about. But the only really large animals we have in here are a couple of deer species uh, and two large cats and the, the tapir, the, the taper. So um, it's an extremely impoverished megafauna. That has not always been the case. If we look at Mexico across the board, um, we can see that in the late Pleistocene, this is only part of the record we have, by the way. There are a lot more species than this showing, or at least three more sloth species that don't even show up here. And I see the list there, no, at least four more species. Um, so it's, a, it's an extremely diverse megafauna in the terminal Pleistocene before people get here. This is what's known from the drier parts of Mexico. But the problem with tropical environments is they're not very good for preservation. Because of the high rainfall levels, especially in the areas under the intertropical convergence, um, you have so much vegetation that not only is the, the soil acidic because of the water moving through it with the carbonic acid in it from dissolved CO2, but also you get the breakdown of plant materials in the forest floor and also because of the extensive um, vegetation in these wetter tropical environments you don't get much sedimentation in the streams because there's not very much erosion in the system. It's mostly just dis chemical dissolution of the mineral parts. So fossils don't preserve well. To preserve fossils it's best to have a calcareous environment with rapid deposition and burial. We don't have that generally in the tropics. But here in the Yucatan, we have an unusual situation. It's a broad, flat, limestone platform that is therefore uniformly calcareous, um, very basic, or at least on the marginal side of basic. Uh, good conditions for preservation as long as we didn't have, as long as we have some way of keeping the bones out of the weather. And we do have that in the Yucatan. There are thousands, it is expected, or is, is uh, predicted, of kilometers of tunnels underneath in you know, what's called a karst system of the Yucatan. In Quintana Roo alone, the easternmost state of, of the Yucatan Peninsula, there are over 1,500 mapped kilometers of these tunnel systems. These sometimes collapse to the surface, and we get what we call cenotes. So the cenotes, there's little windows into this extensive karst system. Cave divers have been working in this area, making it their quest to explore what is one of the last unexplored places on Earth, underground, and mapping them. And we have some, you know, a lot of these guys are, are members of the Global Underwater Explorers Group, and they are, it's, it's extremely rigid in its rules. I'm certified that way, and it drives me a little nuts because I'm not that kind of person but it attracts engineers because of the rigidity of it. And so these guys are really good map makers, and so they're making these really detailed maps of the systems. But you can see the beauty that they get to swim through. They often find bones down there. A lot of bones of, of ancient Maya people, but also bones of megafauna. What we're seeing here is the femur, tibia, and mandible of a gomphothere, an extinct elephant-like animal. Sometimes, these skeletons are complete. This is a complete 
skeleton of a, a new kind of giant ground sloth, one that we've just recently named. So it's just incredible down there. It's beautiful, the water's totally clear, and you get to find all these really cool big animals. We also sometimes find animal tracks in what used to be dry or semi-dry, kind of moist environments. These are tracks of an agouti, one of the little rodent, or one of the large rodent species of the region. Now, I work with the um, Oyo Negro Project, and the Oyo Negro Project was initiated through the work of Proyecto Espeleológico de Tulum. And that is um, Tulum Speleological Project for you obligate in English speakers. But um, what they have taken on as their quest, there are a lot of these cave diver groups, and, and the Tulum Project has taken as its effort the mapping of Outland Cave which is a cave system about 10 kilometers north of the city of Tulum and not far from the very well-known ruin of the same name. This is what it was like on the, the jungle surface in 2005, shortly before they began their work. Those little light spots on the right side are cenotes in the jungle floor. You can see how uniform this was. This is what they have mapped since. It's this very extensive tunnel system. Um, in the center of, kind of where three major tunnels meet down here toward the center of the picture, they found an immense collapse chamber inside the, in the ground, in the dark. In exploring this, this is what it looks like. You're gonna get a better look at it, at it shortly. You get to play in there for a moment. But this is, this is Oyo Negro. It's 200 meters wide. This is their map of it. It's a giant bell-shaped chamber, an, an inescapable natural trap that is about 60 meters wide, uh, 45 to 50, 55 meters deep at its deepest point, which you're not seeing right there. And the nearest entrance to it is a little tiny slit in the forest floor, 65 meters away. Uh, and the animals didn't get in that way because if they had fallen that, that 10 meter drop, we wouldn't see them in the pit because they couldn't have walked there. So these animals walked in when these tunnels were dry during the last glacial period. This is, we, yesterday you heard about collaboration. This is a collaboration. This is a lot of people working here. We have uh, participants in our group from multiple institutions in three countries. United States, Canada, and Mexico. The project is a project of the Instituto Nacional de Antropología e Historia, the National Institute of Anthropology and History that manages all these wonderful archaeological tourist sites in the, in the nation of Mexico. Uh, the leader of the project is Pilar Luna, Pilar Luna Arregarena, who was until recently the director of uh, Ina Subacuática. The fossil record in Oyo Negro itself is extremely unusual, and it's the equivalent of, of, if you've ever heard of it, the La Brea tar pits, only without the tar and the skeletons aren't scattered and scratched and broken up. They're actually quite often intact. You can see how good the preservation is. Thus far, we have at least 28 large animals in this cave, and we keep finding a new one each time we enter, because, geez, the area is the size of an American football field, right? About two-thirds the size of a real football field. Um, it's a big thing to, to search. And remember, these fellows are searching it with a flashlight in the dark. So, searching a football field with a flashlight. And uh, so, 28 large mammal species, or large mammals of 13 species in the cave, in, in the pit. Uh, six of these are extinct, but we have additional animals in the tunnels nearby. There are at least seven animals, I think it's more than that now, and two additional extinct species are found within there, in that group. And the preservation, as you can see, of this pelvis and femur of Agonfathir is amazing. Oh, I didn't think I could do that. Here, that little button is so small. This is, uh, we have two Highland Gonfathirs. This is one that just sort of fell in a heap. You can see the skull, the, the uh, uh, mandible, the pelvis, the femur on the right side there, tusk down here on the left. Two of those. 
two saber-toothed cats, probably Smilodon Fatalis. We hope to take him out this fall. Um, two shafts of ground sloths in the cave, one in the tunnels. This is the arm of one of them hanging on the cave wall. We'll be exploring one of them this fall as well. A new species of megalonychid ground sloth related to the two-toed sloth that still exists um, that uh, is new to science. This is the first time it's ever been found and described. This is one we have uh, taken part of out and have published recently on. You can see the guano. It's covered with bat guano. Um, one large canid that has its origins in South America, and I don't have the latitude of talking to you about that one because we're trying to publish on it and we don't want to lose that opportunity. Um, seven members of the genus Arctotherium, which is another South American carnivore species. Arctotherium is a bear related to the modern spectacle bears you see, that you see on the left. We have s at least seven of those and just give you a quick rundown of some of them. The divers have an easy time finding skulls because they've gotten familiar with the idea of the foramen magnum. And so they see that round opening and round openings are not set normal. So they find skulls first and then the rest of the things follow. But you can see um, a skull. Yeah, that's where it's. Oh, well, a skull there, a skull there, a skull here, a skull there. And that's, not, that's only one of those is the ones we've collected. We've collected some of them already. Three pumas, that two of which occur as complete skeletons just lying on the cave bottom. One of them's broken up. That's this one. He's fractured limbs when it fell. Three tapers, at least. Three in the cave and at least two in the tunnels. I think the count is even higher than that now. Um, two peccaries of probably the modern collared peccary. Kawadi, a couple of small cats that we are yet to identify, um, and a couple of other small carnivores, again, that we haven't been able to see carefully, uh, closely enough in the photographs to identify. Most of our work, and, and in the tunnels, we have a, a mylodont sloth. This is paramylodon harlani. This is a grassland sloth in the Yucatan, which is now a jungle. It kind of gives you a hint at change. And we have bear tracks in the tunnels. This is the find of the year for us. We, we found these in May. And, and look at those things. They're going to tell us about the locomotion. This, and this species, this, this form, this Arctotherium, has never been found in much more than small fragments of mandible, maxilla, teeth, things like that. We now have multiple complete skulls. We have skeletal elements. We can probably collect seven of these things if we wanted to, but we don't have that much money. We don't have very much, actually. Um, and now we have their tracks so we can understand their locomotion and see what their paw form is because it's awfully hard to find paw bones in bat guano. So this is, this is truly the find of the year. And we have a human that the divers have dubbed Naya. Naya is a, a naiad, the, the Greek guardians of bodies of water. She is down there. Her bones are scattered among the bones of one of our gonfathiers. So... How did they get in there? Everybody wants to know that question. Here's an older map of Oyo Negro, less complete, but showing you possible routes in from known cenotes. The closest one is 2,100 feet. That's 600 kilometers. Or since, I'm sorry, 600 meters. 600 kilometers quite a ways. Um, 600 meters from the nearest possible entrance at the time. That's probably the way in. These animals were in there in the dark. Most of them are sent orienters, so they can just walk into a place that's totally dark and find their way around if somebody else has been there before them. And they're probably following the scent of water because the Yucatan, because of the car systems, is a sieve. Water falls on it and runs right through. You don't have many ponds. You don't have any streams. So if water is to be found, it's to be found in drip puddles inside the caves. And animals, um, I'm certain, used those. That's probably why we see so many animal tracks. They're in there finding the water. Now, how did they get there? Well, they probably walked in there looking for water, and then they fell in. Many of them have broken bones. This is a, a green bone fracture in one of our peccaries. We've seen this in five different species of breaks, including the human, that they fell into 
what's probably shallow water, their bodies floated. The, the distribution of bones tells us that these were floating corpses that, that disintegrated in pieces in the way floating corpses do. So they fell into a pool of water of some depth, but not very deep in the bottom of the cave. We've spent most of the last six years documenting this site. Uh, many, many photographs, videos, uh, depth recordings on the different finds in the site, uh, profile and uh, complete mapping of the cave with measurements. And then most recently, through thousands of photographs over the past four years, we now have a composite of this site made up from a structure from motion um, modeling. And you're going to get to look at that now. A video, please. You get to be a diver. I've never even been diving in this cave, so this is really fun for me. You're going through one of the tunnels. This is the entry tunnel that I told you about that they probably walked in through. You've gone, oops, I'm falling down now. And that's the pit itself. We're swooping down toward where the human was found. Here are her arm bones. There's a rib of her gonfather there. One of the arms is red. I don't know why the modeler has that, but you can see those are... That's her right arm there. Her bones of her legs and her pelvis are farther away over here at the same elevation, which says that she was in a pool of water at about 40 meters depth that she was floating, depth below present sea level. And we're going to back up again and woof. Now we're sweeping in kind of under the rim. You can see how this is a enclosed space, and this is our new species of giant ground sloth, its pelvis and bones of its legs, and all the bat guano that's covering it. Part of its skull that had floated a ways away. The rest of the skull can't be far away because the gas inside the, ba the brain case caused it to, allowed it to float for a distance. Back up again. There's a bear here. Again, in a pile of guano from bats that had to be just a few, a couple of meters above it. It's a skull of a bear. We've, that provided a wonderful scientific opportunity there. One of the pumas. You can see it's still articulated. And some distance away, because this is the only one that's not in that deep part of the cave. This, see the little black, black circles? Those are bat guano piles. They, those fell into shallow water, so they were dispersed somewhat. And this is the skull of our new canid, covered with um, flowstone which is an opportunity for dating it. We'll be dating it with uranium thorium dating here shortly. You get a sense of the immensity of this place. These dark circles are all bat guano piles. And this is something that the divers like to call the fire pit, but um, no one would be in there making a fire because you can't get out. It's just a basin that's collected charcoal. There's a lot of charcoal in the site. The lighter color is shallower, the deeper color blue is deeper. Uh, 
That's what light does underwater, so it's a, a good depth indicator. All these photos were taken from the same elevation in the, in the cave, and so we get the, the coloration provides us information about depth, except for that brightly lit part on the side. That was photographed close up with lights. That bright part. Okay. I think we can end that now. So now you're cave divers. You've gotten a sense of what it's like, only they don't get to see it like this. Remember, they're, they're moving with a flashlight. So this is an image of the, the silhouettes of the megafaunal species, again, being charitable to the peggery, um, that occur on the floor of Oyo Negro. Half of them are extinct, not counting the human. Half of them are extinct, or I'm sorry, Two-thirds of them are extinct, six out of, ni out of nine. And uh, we also have two other megafauna species in the tunnels that are not represented there. Uh, if you could, ne um, that's me, next slide. Another ground sloth, and I believe we have a camelid in there. Some of the photographs are taken by a different group, and it's a little hard to be sure of where they came from. But we have a small camelid, probably Paleolama or Hemialkenia, this gives you a sense of how much we've lost. But when we look elsewhere in Yucatan, in other caves, and in, the, in this drier side of, of Yucatan, uh, in an area called Loltun Cave, which is south of here, uh, a short distance, uh, we have Arimatherium, Glyptotherium, Equus conversidens. So we have a giant, giant ground sloth, taller than an elephant, uh, a, gly a Glyptodont, which is a big uh, ankylosaur kind of creature, a Hemialkenia, a camelid, equus conversidens, a horse, dire wolf, and some deer that may be just the modern Odoicoileus. But those are the rest of the megafauna that we have in the Yucatan. So if you have a picture the same way, the black one's extinct and the red one's extant, this is what the caves are telling us about the diversity of fauna back in the terminal Pleistocene. So the question we come up with is, what part, if any, which, which of these animals are contemporaneous? Is this a time transgressive diversity? So there's different ecosystems in there across time uh, with different species occupying them. Or is it a, a contemporaneous uh, diversity? And what part, if any, do the humans play in the extinction of this megafauna? Can we document that effectively? And we are, we are obtaining hints in this site about that. Now, the environments of the late Pleistocene, it, it, it changed quite rapidly here, as you can expect in a place with this level of diversity and this close to the subtropical high. You get shifts of the position of the intertropical convergence, which is the wet part of the system, and the shifts in the position north and southward of the subtropical high, which is the dry end of the system. So you get this range of wet to dry. And during the full glacial, we have a cool, moist environment in, in the site of... Uh, in Lake Petenitsa, which is in about 300, actually about 100 kilometers elevation uh, in uh, northern, northern uh, Guatemala, which is the closest environmental record we have to this region so far until we get our studies finished. It's a, it's a woodland of pine and oak at that low elevation. And since its environment now is much the same as the environment at Oyo Negro, we might expect the same sort of thing there. Then in... 18,000 to 10,300 years ago, and I will be referring to that as Cal BP or calibrated years ago, um, we have drier, cooler, uh, drier conditions. Um, thorn woodland is sort of the expectation of that. So it's sort of a grassy, savanna like environment with a lot of thorn trees, but with encroaching, encroaching jungle plants toward the end. And then we have tropical forest fully developed after 10,000 years ago. So, are we looking at a contemporaneous fauna or a time transgressive fauna? So, what we're doing at Oyo Negro to research these issues is recovering and identifying some species in paleontology. If you don't have the specimen in hand so someone else can study the same piece in a museum somewhere, you cannot say what animal you have. So, all these identifications up to this point are provisional. We're determining their age, and that's a challenge and a half. 
That's the big challenge for me. Stable isotope analyses to look at dietary variations and, and which part of the, which kind of ecosystem they're exploiting. Are they looking at grasses, going after grasses or going after uh, C3 plants? Bioarchaeology, what does the human tell us herself from her physical characteristics? And then we're going to be looking at paleohydrology, paleobotany, and paleoclimatology, but those three are further in the future for us for the lar in, the, in large part. I will be giving you some hints about the paleobotany, but that's just, just barely hints. So, recovery and identification of priority species. What I've gone through at my paleontological... Huh, I'll slow down here for you non-speakers. My colleague among the paleontologists um, is and I are working out the priority of collection of species. They are the human, the new sloth, the bears because their morphology is not known except for their mandibles, the new canid species because it's a very extra limital from its original place of origin, the pumas because pumas were extinct in North America during the Pleistocene, so they came back in. Is this the part of the group that came back into North America or is it, is it a separate one? Uh, we're going to study the other sloths to look at variations in their um, diet across a year because they have continuously growing teeth. We also want to identify them and get some DNA from them if we can. The saber tooths to identify them and so forth. So we're, we're looking at these species in sort of a priority sequence. It's very expensive and time consuming to collect these because we have to work with technical divers to do it. They only have an hour at a time to work down there each day. One hour a day and you're done. So here's one of the bears. He's getting it ready to gather it up. He likes to show them off so we get lots of pictures of them holding skeletons out in front of themselves. But this is the uh, skull of one of our Arctotherium species individuals, a large male. Uh, this guy's so big we refer to him as Brutus. Collection, they go to the laboratory for identification and here a second one of these bears we took out earlier is being compared to a, an American black bear. You can see how much larger it is. It's more like a giant panda in its morphology than it is like a, a North American bear. We got the new canid. Here's how, what it looks like when you bring it to the surface. The mandible of the new giant sloth. Its identification, we published this in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology just this month. You can get a sense of what it looks like. And we named it, gave it a Maya name, Nohochi Chakshi Balbaka, which means giant clock underworld dweller. So to determine the ages, this has been the challenge. So looking at Good, perfect. Okay, changes in sea level is one way to look at it because the sea level, during the full glacial, the sea level was 120 meters lower than it is now. So you think about, oh my God, sea level's gonna come up a meter and a half or two meters this century. Imagine living sometime around 12,000 years ago when it was going up significantly faster than that. So um, sea level change gives us a sense, where we are in the sea level gives us a sense of where we are in time if we knew the sea level chronology for this region, which we don't know very well. Um, radiocarbon dating bone collagen, radiocarbon dating tooth enamel, each has its own challenges. But radiocarbon dating superimposed things and uh, superimposed wood, seeds, and guano, but also uranium thorium dating calcite that has been formed on top of the bones after deposition. Extremely time consuming and in the case of uranium thorium dating, extremely expensive. So this is how we're going about dating and I'll give you a quick hint about this. I'm gonna take you through some of how the sausage is made for dating. Um, this, the, so this is sort of a schematic of the bottom of Oyo Negro from before we had the really good 3D model. And the red arrows are where the uppermost piece of each of the animals was found, each of the individual animals. And you can see that they form sort of an oval. Or a little bit more like a kidney. But um, it's a hint that sea level might be an indicator. Because remember, it's deeper on this lower part of the, and higher, shallower on the upper part. So when we look at their depth, 
The red shows you where the highest piece of each animal was. The animals are on the top line there. And the pink shows you where the lowest one was, the bottom, the floor of the cave. Most of the animals, almost all of the animals, highest piece is 43 to 40 meters in depth. They're in like a, what we would say in the English system, a 10 foot span, a three meter span. That's not very much given the depth of this place. So that might give a hint that maybe the animals could be from the same age if sea level had been at that point at the time they died. So in looking at the possibility of that, we take a look at the characteristics of the cave wall in that space. Man, my heart's still thumping. Whew. God. Um, look at the brown color. The kind of orangey brown, that iron rich band. That's the 40 to 43 meter depth. Water was there often. It's mineral stained. That says that we're not looking at a continuously rising sea level and the animals representing a moment in time, we're looking at a stable, it's a bathtub ring we call it, we're looking at an occasional pool that animals fell into probably because when it was a pool there was water there and they were seeking the water. So it took a long time for my cave geochemist to accept that. They kept saying that's not possible because the area is such a sea of water just goes directly out and I said don't tell me why it can't exist, tell me why it does because clearly it does exist. Models don't answer everything. So you have the occasional pool and the animals are around its rim because floating corpses float to the edges because water's higher in the middle and they float out. So very characteristic. I do forensic anthropology on the side for coroners. Um, so animals, all we know is Animals predate the final post-glacial inundation above 40 meters below sea level. They're, they're older than that. That's the best we can do from sea level. So, we have reconstructed the sea levels, the level, water levels in Oyo Negro. It's the work of a young man named Sean Collins at McMaster University. And what we see over on the right here at the bottom, this is where the sea level begins to rise above after 9,850 years ago. So after about 10,000 years ago, the floor of the cave was flooded permanently. So no, long, no more occasional pool. It's just filling up continuously after that. And the rim of the cave up to the floor of the tunnels, and this will be important in a moment, 8,100 years ago is when they, there was no longer a way for an animal to walk over the edge like I almost did here and fall into the cave. They'd have had to swim. So... The minimum age for almost all of the mammal fossils we have in there, and probably all the mammal fossils in the bottom of the cave because of their distribution, is 10,000 years. They are late Pleistocene. So we tried to radiocarbon date collagen. We've attempted on five individuals that we've the five individuals we've collect, we've collected so far. Uh, one of the gonfathiers, the sloth, the new sloth, the puma, the bear, and and the human. And we've had two successes. Unfortunately, one of them was not the human. One success and one pending. I think we're gonna get to know this guy because we have a lot of protein. I haven't run it yet. And Spike over there on the other side, the somewhat smaller monster bear. Um, that's Spike and Brutus that we have. Um, we have a date on Spike. And Spike dates, Arctotherium number five is his official designation. 13,200 to 12,800 years ago. So he's clearly late Pleistocene. If we take and then look, we can radiocarbon date tooth enamel. It's slightly problematic, but we've solved the problems. Naya, our girl, dates 12,900 to 12,700. She overlaps the bear. Um, our Cuvironius, however, is significantly older. He's from even before all of our paleoecological paleo record from the region. Um, so he's kind of out of the game as far as being associated in time with Naya, with whom his bones are assembled. So we did, to corroborate both those dates, we did overlying uranium, um, uranium thorium dating on overlying calcite formations, these little star-like things here, these little bush-like things. We call them florets. Um, it's not an official name in geology, I understand. But uh, that's the mandible, by the way, up 
up top. You can see the teeth right up there. I can't make the light work. Um, so she it, it says that she's over 12,000 years old, which corroborates the date on the enamel. The Cuvironius, however, he's much, still much older. He's more than 19,000 years old. Uh, and that one's a little problematic. The, the radiocarbon material is probably a little tainted because it's got... Uh, um, there are studies of it have shown it's got a lot more uh, diagenesis. It's changed its content. So it's probably closer to this 19,000 years than 40,000 years. Arctotherium, we've dated the guano over the top of it. It's around 11,000 years. Dated the guano and wood over the top of our, our new sloth. And it's also a little over 11,000 years. So at least that old for these two animals. Again, it corroborates the date on the Arctotherium. And hopefully it'll corroborate whatever we get on the sloth. So, we also have tracks as an indicator of age, and in looking at this slide this morning, I noticed the shells. I can date those. So I'm pretty excited. I can radiocarbon date shells, and they don't get contaminated easily. They're really quite intact. So here's the sloth, see the bear, see how its feet have crunched through the crust right here? That crust was almost new when those, when those tracks went in, so I can get dates on that on the shell and find out how old it is. But we know it's around 8,000 years old because that's when the water level reached that point. So those bears may have been down a long time. So here's quick on the story. We have three animals that might be contemporary. The human, the bear, and, and the new sloth. Two of them, showing with the red parentheses, we know are the human and the, and the bear are contemporary at the very least. So the environment then... Is, our record is time transgressive, we know this, but um, a lot of those animals, at least three of the four that we've got so far, are from one time period, and that's the late dry interval. So what's the relationship between the humans and the loss of diversity? Because they seem to be contemporary, at least in part. So one hint is from diet. Our human is at the bottom. Hochi Chak is at the top. Can you guys see that in numbers at all? Uh, we're around nine for, for the, the bear and the sloth and 12 for the human. This is tooth enamel, mind you. So what we're looking at is a C3 diet, you know, a C3 uh, uh, food chain for all of them. The human is eating plants and animals of uh, C3 origin. So they're eating in the same, you know, they're in the same kind of environment at least for them. Now, hints from Naya. Naya is what, this is my thing, because I work with skeletons of humans, mostly. So we're looking at her dental health, her growth patterns, her musculoskeletal markings, the way her muscles worked her bones, and her stable isotopes fill in that too. You've already seen what that is. 12, I'll give you a hint on that right now. If her diet were marine, it would be closer on to the side of four to six with a mix of C3 plants. So she is definitely not feeding on a marine diet. I'll tell you that hint right now. Okay, so we recovered her with a great deal more care than we did do the bones because her bones are much more delicate. They're not as well preserved as some of the big animals are. All planned to the teeth, literally. So we have almost all of her skeleton. Give you that very quickly. Complete skull and almost the entire skeleton parts are not shown here because they're in two different cities at the moment, and they're on their way to be reunited this week. So Naya was a gracile female, 152 centimeters tall, more or less, muscle minerals, and uh, 15 to 17 years old. By the way, she'd already been a mother, too, to give you a hint of the way life was back then. What her teeth tell us, she has very little wear on her teeth, and she has a lot of cavities. Cavities tell you there's a lot of sugar in the diet. Very little wear tells you there's no grit and no fibrous component to her diet. She's not eating roots. She's not eating things off the beach, like shellfish and stuff, because you get a lot of grit in her teeth and wear them down fast. She's not, again, not feeding from the marine environment, and she's not eating tough things. She's eating easy things to chew. What that says is she's got a soft, grit-free diet and fresh meat, fruit, and honey 
is her diet, not dried meat because that would be abrasive. So that tells us a great deal. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you this part. Naya is the oldest human in the Americas. So she is our hint at the very beginning of human activity in the region. We look at growth patterns to understand the nature, what her life was like, and we see numerous growth interruptions in her bones and teeth indicated by the arrows. This, I can look at that, I forgot. Um, this shows you again, uh, tibia down below, femur up above. A well-fed individual on the right, Naya on the left. Look at all those lines. Those are periodic lines. Those are seasonal growth interruptions. We also have episodic interruptions in between those. They tell us that her people were often short of protein, but they did not exploit the nearby marine environment because they would always be able to get protein. This is the tropics, after all. Even in the Pleistocene, it was more or less subtropical. So they, could not, they did not exploit the nearby envi marine environment. That's consistent with their Delta C13 information. So everything is pointing in the same direction. Now, we look at musculoskeletal markings. Her arms are minimally developed in muscle. This, this is showing you where the, the two major muscles of the body would be. Uh, the major muscle of the shoulder is the deltoid. The deltoid tuberosity, which is a point where it attaches, is right there. This is the gluteus maximus uh, insertion right there. One, is, the one on the left isn't developed at all. There is, it's absolutely featureless. However, gluteus maximus is, is like that of a middle-aged man. And in generally, her legs look like those of a middle-aged man. She's got the, the contact with her, her patellar tendon right below her kneecap is so extensively developed that it overlaps the bone of the tibia. It just reaches out and forms a shelf. So she is doing a great deal with her legs and not a whole lot with her arms. She's not processing food. She's not grinding anything. She's not digging food up. She's not making complex things with her arms. But she's walking and running constantly. Her pelvis tells us this too. It's, it's more like the pelvis of a male than a female. But she's clearly a male. There's no, or a female, there's no question about that. So she's extremely developed for her age. It says these people are highly mobile, in an open country, if it were not open country, she'd have to use her arms to get around a good deal of getting up and over things. So she's not doing that. It's highly mobile in an open country, but proce that processing activities, doing anything much with her arms, even probably scraping skins a great deal, she's not doing that. So what were the first occupants of the Yucatan doing? They were newly arrived. They didn't know their area very well. If they'd known their area well enough, they'd have adapted to a way to get protein during that season of the year they weren't getting it, during that lean season, which probably is the dry season. They were traveling constantly and traveling light. She's not carrying a lot, because if she were carrying a lot, we'd see its effects in her arms and in her lower back, and we do not see those. It's wonderful to have an entire skeleton. She is the first one, the first female younger, older than 9,000 years for which we have a complete leg. We also have complete arms and a pelvis. We don't have a pelvis from any of the others either. So she is telling us a great deal. And it's not a very pretty record, I'll tell you that, but we'll publish on that later. So they're newly arrived and unfamiliar. They're traveling constantly in light, and they're living off the cream of the terrestrial ecosystem, fruit, honey, and fresh meat. And just to give you a quick um, spoiler here, a quick hint at something we're going to try and publish in Nature later this year. Um, I think the packages that that meat came in were large. The evidence indicates that. So, what's going on then? So, hints from the paleobotany that we have so far. The relationship between the ages of charcoal and the ages of seeds in the bat guano tell us something very interesting about what people are doing. Radiocarbon age of charcoal, the scale on the left, which again you can't see very well, ranges from 12,000 to 3,000 here. The, the charcoal ages tend to be 10,000 years and older with a single exception. So they range from just about 11,400 to 10,000 years. And then they more or less stop. If we take, and it's from multiple sites, there are five sites represented here and they're all giving us the same sort of record. This is a period 
of either dryer or people may have been fighting back the jungle with fire, and I think the latter, that, that, that is true. When we take a look at the ages of the guano, represented by everything with the white dots on top, again, 12,000, and get, this time we're ending at 7,000 years because we're looking at a narrow point in time. If you compare that to what we showed for the box in the previous one, that's where the charcoal lies. So there's a little bit of jungle stuff showing up. The, the, the seeds are from jungle plants. They're from yellow oleander and, and, and uh, um, chicle and things like that. So they're the kind of plants that we see in the, in the tropical system. But they're starting to show up about 11,000 years ago, but they don't increase until after 10,000 years ago when the fire stops. So what it looks like is that we have an encroaching forest that people are attempting to control. We see evidence of this across Central America, that, that fire is being used by the earlier occupants of the region. This is gonna be extremely destructive to habitat. It's gonna be destructive to the young of various species, uh, megafaunal species, especially the sloths, because they can't get away. They can't run. So this is gonna be particularly destructive to those species. So people are having a huge impact on the diversity of the system. So what the lessons of Oyo Negro so far are about what's been happening to biodiversity in the region, the Yucatan Caves are giving us a tremendous faunal record. And that record just changes each time, each time we look. At least some of the fauna that is found in that cave, I'm a megafauna both in Oyo Negro and the system at large, is, was co coeval with the first humans to arrive in the region, and they may have lasted, lived together, at least with the bears, for 5,000 years. That remains to be established for sure, but that's the way it looks. The first arrivals exploited this fauna from the growth patterns, that's what it tells us, moving rapidly across the landscape, constant mobility. They're not hanging around one place and cleaning it out. They're going to move, 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 move. They're doing more like a uh, a browser does. Take a leaf here, take a leaf there, take a leaf there. They're moving constantly. This is going to be very destructive. And through their attempts to manage the changing e ecosystem, they probably contributed to the rapid decline of the megafauna. This is a huge team, and these are truly my co-authors, or at least some of them. Um, we probably have, next article, we'll probably have 25 or more authors on it, and that's... Whew. <clears throat> I don't know about you guys, but co-authorship is <clears throat> exciting. So, preguntas. Perfect. Right on the time. Okay. Yes. Naya is coeval with the Clovis culture in North America, which has the big fluted projectile point, spear points and scraping tools and so forth that are very uniform across its range. The earliest stone tool um, assemblages we see in C Central America so far are Clovis. So her, her being coeval with Clovis and Clovis being the only thing we know of in the region suggests that she was Clovis also. So she's the first Clovis person we've actually had a chance to look at. She has no tools with her, unfortunately. We have to infer from her body what's going on. I see a hand right in the back. You, yes, waving your hand like this. Yeah. Yeah. Can I have some help uh, finding the hands? It's hard for me to see up here with a light. Yeah, I think. <sighs> Thanks for uh, the fantastic talk. And um, my question is related to the number of glaciations that uh, took place during the Pleistocene. The number uh, of what now? Glaciations. Glaciations. Glaci yeah, glaciations. Oh. Because um, what I notice in many of these debates about the role of humans in the decline of the megafauna in Mexico and in North America in general, is that it's strongly concentrated in the last glaciation. But many times often we forget that a lot of this megafauna had already survived to so many of the glaciations that were about 40 ah, yes. in this part of the, of the world. Okay. Uh, the question has to do with 
how many, in fact, there were multiple glaciations in the Pleistocene, and these species and their diversity survived all of those. And a lot of the argument in, in North, especially in North America, you get to some in South America too, Argentina a little bit, that, well, the people, it wasn't the people, it was the ecological change that brought the extinctions. Uh, you know, I don't know my audience very well, but ordinarily I would use certain words to explain that, but um, to say <laughs> no. Um, it's extremely unlikely that it's just environmental change, and e climatic change that brought the extinction of these species. Um, the smoking gun is the people, and, and Naya is the smoking gun. She does provide direct evidence of it, and that's again what I want to publish on later, so I won't go into the detail of it. I'll get you second. I'm going to get him first. Yes, you. Oh, right there. Sorry. Um, you said that her pelvis was so worn it almost looked male. Is that because of uh, physiological and evolutionary differences, or because generally males walk more? Yes. We don't know. We're working on answering that question. We've got actually um, two of the experts working with me here at Awadi, actually. The uh, uh, Inst University of Yucatan are working on that issue. But it's, it's likely that, that it's the, the mobility that is selecting for a somewhat more male-like characteristic, characteristics in the females, too, because they have to maintain mobility with the males. And this poses true challenges for childbirth. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thanks for a great talk. I'm uh, from Michigan, and my colleague Dan Fisher, I presume you, you know him, he works with Macedons, and uh, the hunting activities of Homo sapiens in, in what is today Michigan included a big storage effect. They used to store the meat in bogs, which were acidic, and they, there's a lot of evidence now that they use that over the entire year, uh, so one hunting effect would have uh, would enable them to feed themselves for an entire year. What sort of, and what do you anticipate might be this a similar situation in the Yucatan? If they're hunting large mammals, are they just eating them all at once, or do they have some sort of a way of storing them that you would imagine? Okay, um, it's unlikely they stored them because um, that takes processing activity, and the females usually do the processing activity and Naya's body doesn't say she was doing processing activity. That's one thing. Another is, this is not an environment that, that sort of semi-warm thorn forest or thorn woodland environment that she apparently entered into isn't really a very good one for even having meat last long enough to store it somewhere. The nice thing about Michigan is it's cold. Um, and the, uh, the storage of food in the bogs in Michigan is also um, de under debate. So, <laughs> um, it's not clear what's, what's truly going on. Um, but yeah, it's unlikely because of her mobility indications that they were storing food, otherwise she wouldn't have had to walk so much. Yeah. Oh, um, I'm sorry, Who, oh. who's selecting? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, hello. Uh, why do you think uh, Naya had <laughs> shortage of food? That lines that you demonstrate? Um, those growth interruptions look like they're seasonal. So the lack of availability of her primary food, which was, you know, clearly she was eating a lot of fruit, but she will not show growth interruptions from, from, from lack of fruit or having fruit because she doesn't get any protein out of the fruit. So this is a protein limitation. What's happening with the laydown of, of the, the bone matrix is that the protein is laid down and the mineral is laid down on it. And minerals continuously laid down even when the protein is not being laid down, and so you get these white lines. So the white lines say not enough protein to eat. So what's probably going on is there a season, there's a season of year when, when the, the protein source, which I think are you know, primarily the large animals, isn't as available. Either they migrate away or they, they estivate or they become less available. So I think that's what's going on in her case. I think it's a dry season. Thanks for a beautiful talk. I have a question about stalactites and if you could use those for dating. Yes. I know that uh, others in cave studies have shown changes in precipitation affected drip rate. So when the cave right. was dry, the record of that precipitation would be preserved in those stalactites. Have, have you tried that? We are in the process of doing that. We have two stalactites selected this summer for collection. Um, we're looking on the drips on the floor. 
and we're going to pick up a pancake stalagmite and a, and a continuous stalagmite. And the pancake is underneath in that pool, so it'll tell us about the changes in the pool because the pancake structure is it's wet sometimes and dry sometimes, and so sometimes it forms and sometimes it doesn't, so you get layers in it that are separated by calcite raft sediment. Um, and then one up above where it's a continuous drip that there wasn't a pond. And we'll, we're going to look, uh, use uranium thorium to date that sequence and then uh, analyze it for stable um, oxygen isotopes for understanding climatic change. Just a quick yes, comment. Very quick. I, I, thought I, you're I have a 17-year-old oh, daughter. You next. And she Sorry. doesn't like seafood. So I asked myself if some un paleontologist finds her somewhere. I know that sample size is not really uh, easy in, in paleontology, but um, how do you deal with this uh, extrapolating of one single individual to the alimentation of... We of have to make the assumption when we're working with small samples that we're looking with a probability distribution. The likelihood of a random selection from a population being abnormal is very low. Um, I, I'm sorry, I'm being glib because we're running out of time, but I could talk with you more about that after a while. But it's a, it's a sampling issue. When you're sampling from a random distribution, you must assume that you're hitting the, ex the, the norm, not the, not the uh, exception. And we don't make categoric statements either. We make it looks like from this individual that. Yes? Just, I have the same point. She could be an outcast. She could be part of a less dominant part. I mean, I, it, I understand. I just hope there's a paragraph of ca caveat in your paper. Yeah, yeah. Anything's possible, but we're going to work with the probabilities. Yeah. Okay, I think my time is up.